can guess the guest, uh, our uh, speaker series today will be Mr. Jack Pryor speaking on U.S. southern borders and the presence of Iran and Hezbollah in the western hemisphere. Uh, a couple admins. This will be about a 30 to 45 minute uh, presentation. You can submit your questions through the chat pod and uh, we'll get them answered for you. And this presentation uh, will be recorded and then available in our document library later. Um, up in the left hand corner of the screen there's American Land Forces Institution that's Mr. Pryor's website and there's also a link to our website. Um, sir I'm going to bring up your slides and uh, Mr. Pryor you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to start by uh, reviewing some of the uh, uh, my focus over the last couple of years is because I live in Texas and I'm affiliated with the Department of Homeland or the uh, Department of Public Safety and the Texas Rangers at all here in Texas uh, dealing with our issues which are substantial over the last couple of years but in doing that work it's not just in Texas it's across the entire southern border and uh, our relationship along that border with Mexico and some of my opinions about where we're at with that so I'll start with uh, talking a little bit about that and then also my concern of the Iranian and Hezbollah presence throughout the hemisphere and we'll we'll end up talking a little bit about that and take whatever questions you'd like to have uh, taken. Uh, the first thing uh, uh, I'd like to do is uh, is just uh, give you the uh, notion that if you took the uh, from Brownsville, Texas to San Diego, California, and you went one county deep and you made that the 51st state, uh, it would be the poorest uh, state in the union. It would have the highest unemployment rate in the union. Um, it would have some of the highest crime levels uh, in the United States and uh, it, it's, it's a good uh, area for some of the activities that these criminal organizations use as a recruiting ground and uh, the kinds of things they're trying to do. We believe that uh, they're trying to create a sanitary zone uh, about one to two counties deep along the border uh, that will provide sanctuary from Mexican law enforcement that they're undergoing, uh, give them kind of safe zones uh, where they can achieve their objectives and the uh, Cartels in this thing are continuing to increasingly rely on organized gangs that provide expendable and unaccountable manpower to do a lot of their work. Uh, and they're throughout the country. I'm going to show you a couple maps here in a minute. Uh, but uh, let's, let's start with one that kind of sets the tone for this thing. Uh, if you look at this particular map, um, you've all seen uh, the arrows uh, coming from the bottom that come up to the United States. That's a that's a DEA representation. FBI uses it. Several other people. The only thing that isn't on there is usually a couple arrows coming in from the West, and that's precursor chemicals coming in from China. But the point I want to make on this particular slide is if you look at the arrow on the right side. Uh, everything that moves, whether it's drugs or people or cash or weapons or whatever, it has a point of origin. And in this case, it, it, the point of origin uh, starts in some cases all the way down in South America and certainly through uh, Central America and on through Mexico and up. But the point of it is, is that there's a destination. And where is that destination? And... Uh, I don't believe anybody here believes that everything stops at the border. So if you look at all the maps that are portrayed, typically uh, the arrow stop at the, the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, the map on the north shows dots where the FBI and the Justice Department said that transnational criminal organizations are operating within the United States. Now when I did this map, 
which is really a composite from other maps that have already been done, uh, this is representative of about 300, uh, the 243 to 300 cities in America where these groups are operating. And uh, uh, Two weeks after we did this map, the FBI upped the total number of cities that these groups are operating in the United States to 1,000. So again, not everything stops at the border. It just doesn't pile up there. It's got a destination, and it continues uh, to go someplace. So here's the next thing. What happens is uh, as these things come here, again, all the stuff that you see on the right column, murder, assassination, corruption, robbery, etc., those things don't stop here at the border. Uh, they continue to some destination. And that's what I'd like to keep in mind as we go through this uh, discussion uh, of what happens. And it really looks like this. Uh, so uh, it doesn't stop at the border. Things that come across the border, and a comment I'd like to make is uh, uh, in meeting with a lot of the border sheriffs routinely, uh, on one hand, a lot of the uh, businesses from Mexico are coming across into uh, the U.S. side of the border which on one hand is good, it's a good tax base, but the problem, all these things that you see on the right are coming with it. So the sheriffs and law enforcement people along the border from uh, San Diego to Brownsville are getting more and more overwhelmed and they're seeing crimes and level of crime that they've never uh, had to deal with before. So I just want to set that and then I would like to talk uh, uh, a little bit about uh, Mexico because I think it's important. Um, first of all, as a general opinion of mine, is that we have underinvested and uh, have had very weak policy. We've not sustained our policy throughout Latin America, and I believe this weakens us within the Western uh, Hemisphere. And uh, we should be doing a heck of a lot better. And why is Mexico important uh, to us? Well, first of all, it's about three times the size of Texas. It's got 113 million people. Uh, it has now grown over the uh, uh, past decades a middle class that ranges in about 60 million. And Mexico City is 22 million people, and it's one of the largest uh, urban concentrations uh, in the world. Uh, Mexico has to deal with the U.S. partly of our uh, ignorance uh, of uh, the region, quite candidly. And the other thing, uh, we deal with them kind of looking at historical corruption and uh, we've not really uh, done the kinds of things that we need to be supporting, I believe, Mexico. First of all, Mexico is the, uh, and, and, and probably most of you know this, but I'm going to, it's worth repeating. It's the 12th largest economy in the world and it's the second largest economy in Latin America. It has an inflation rate of 3.5% and last year the economy grew at 3.8%, which is a far better cry than we did here in the U.S. It's the seventh largest global crude oil exporter, and it's the second largest supplier of oil to the U.S., uh, and it's the third largest importer to the U.S. It has uh, huge uh, reserves of natural gas, and it's uh, got a rapidly growing GDP that's uh, about 1.6, 1.7 trillion dollars. Mexico's the largest trading partner in, uh, after Canada and China for the U.S. And every single day through NAFTA, billions of dollars of goods crosses the frontier. Uh, we account for about 47% of all foreign direct investment in Mexico, 
and 50% of their imports come from the U.S. 80% of their exports go to the U.S. So the point I'm making here, and I could go on uh, with those kind of statistics, but they're an important player in the hemisphere, and as we look down to the future, uh, they're they're going to be an important player, not only in the region and, and with the U.S., but in terms of the global market. So uh, a stable Mexico is, is in our best interest. Um, we've got uh, 2,000 miles of largely unmarked and unfenced frontier. Uh, we have probably uh, a million legal border crossings per day and about 750,000. Uh, to a million illegal crossings uh, uh, per year. Uh, you're all familiar with the numbers, 52,000 murdered in uh, Mexico uh, as they fight for control. The, the country's lost some control of grounds to the cartels. And the firepower of the cartels is just absolutely <laughs> astonishing. So when you deal with them, you deal uh, with... Uh, a, a pretty potent actual military force within the cartels. Now, uh, what's, what's this mean? Well, it means that uh, Mexico, Central America, and South America are uh, uh, important to us and uh, that we should be uh, paying attention to this thing. Now, uh, the consequences of a porous border are one that, uh, uh, you know, make uh, some, uh, uh, cause some staggering things. And one of the things that we contend, uh, because of this porous border, you've now got communities along the border, and communities, uh, I, I think the number in uh, uh, Mexico, if I remember right, let's see if I've got it here, uh, is a large number of cities in Mexico, uh, actually about 980 local governments in Mexico are the dominant, uh, have dominant criminal presence in it and they actually control the cities. Now, if you think back to the uh, map, that I think this map's still on the screen, of this infiltration coming into America, I can give you several locations that aren't on the border. Salinas, California. Salinas, California is not under control of any legitimate government. It is under the control of uh, gangs. And that's who runs the city. And there's several others deep in uh, side the United States that have the same thing, something we call dual sovereignty. Many of you have probably read about it and heard about it. It goes on all through Latin America and uh, Mexico. And it's now occurring here in the United States. So uh, it's not just a border issue. And so when you know, people talk about the border issues, um, it's more than the border. It's the consequences, the second and third order effects and consequences of, uh, of a porous border and what happens. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, when... Uh, uh, people say that everything's better than it's ever been on the border. Uh, here's a couple things that I think that uh, they don't they don't recognize. First of all, kids come across the border to go to school in the United States, and uh, that's okay. That's been going on for hundreds of years. Nothing new. The difference today is is that you've got uh, kids that come across the border and now have PTSD. Uh, and those poor school districts down there are not equipped to handle uh, these kids, so they've got problems, they're disruptive to the rest of the kids going to school, uh, and then when you get to the junior high age, there's a lot of recruiting of our kids uh, to be scouts and accept the types of things uh, that go on uh, in, in that uh, particular area and go on throughout Central in South America as well. So so that's uh, one thing. Uh, the other thing that we have, uh, and I'm most familiar with in, in uh, Texas, we have uh, 
for example, in Brooks County in the last five years, we found over 700 bodies that are in the uh, uh, out on ranchers' lands and and uh, come across, and almost all of them are homicides. None of those are recorded in any crime statistic. So when folks use uh, this as uh, well, our murder rate's lower than it's ever been, or whatever, whatever, it's just not really true. And if you go across all the counties, whether you're in Texas or Arizona or New Mexico, every one of these county sheriffs find bodies uh, within their areas. These tend not to be reported. And so those are just some of the, uh, I actually had a congressman tell me <laughs> that, uh, well, they're just illegals. And I don't view it as that at all. They're human beings that lost their lives on our so sovereign territory. and. Uh, and uh, we don't even capture that information. Poor counties have to deal with it, uh, those kinds of things. So those are just a few of the consequences. Now, what happens? They come in, they start with their enforcers and their uh, uh, people who buy up the, uh, uh, their scouts. Uh, they start buying real estate, which uh, they've done a lot of, and, and, and uh, uh, in recent, because of the real estate problem, they use those as future stash houses, all kinds of things. But it start getting a foothold in the local economies. Then they start buying legitimate businesses, and pretty soon these small communities' uh, livelihood are totally dependent on uh, this uh, criminal element that's now a hybrid between legitimate business and illegitimate businesses. What I'm trying to paint is a picture here of an environment that the the uh, the terrorist organizations uh, uh, take advantage of. Anything on this slide: murder, assassination, uh, assaults, kidnapping, torture, extortion, corruption, uh, human smuggling, sex trade, drugs. Uh, all of those things that we uh, associate with the cartels and transnational criminal organizations, the terrorist organizations are involved with uh, as well. And so they exploit the networks of the drug cartels and the porous borders, uh, and they have all the trappings of any traditional military force, including the command and control, logistics, intelligence, information operations, and increasingly more deadly firepower. So uh, the intention is to increasingly bring governments at all levels throughout the Americas under the influence of international cartels and terrorist organizations. Uh, Iran uh, has been expanding its diplomatic, economic, and military activity in Latin America and, uh, and with some very strategic objectives in the Western Hemisphere. They're attempting to alter the balance of power and influence in the hemisphere. And so uh, they, they use these kinds of uh, activities and networks on their behalf. Now, uh, you're probably all familiar with the term special uh, uh, illegal aliens. Uh, and I was in recently at a meeting, well, not recently, it was about, a, about nine, ten months ago. Where we, we capture, across the entire border area, we capture about, uh, oh, five to six hundred of these folks per year. Uh, the, uh, okay, let me do this here. He's telling me to reduce the, is Jay, is that better? Okay, hopefully that's, uh, okay, um, let's see, uh, I had to change my volume here, um, okay, um, 
so consequently, the, this, this nexus of terrorist organizations and transnational criminal organizations to include the cartels has become better, more and more linked. In fact, you've got a number of gangs in the United States now that are directly linked to terrorist organizations. Back in the uh, early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, when I was the director of counter-narcotics for Southcom, uh, we saw at that time a, a very loose federations between these organizations and they kind of uh, came together for convenience if they wanted to accomplish a certain objective. Well, over the years, this has become more and more and more solidified. And uh, one of the fears is the is a nuclear fear, uh, and that's probably the number one threat to the United States right now. But let's let's talk about Iran. Uh, they do want to shift the balance of power. Uh, uh, I don't think we've taken a good enough look at it, although we're well aware of what's here. But the largest embassy Iran has in the world is in uh, Venezuela, and uh, they they using that as a base and the support of the uh, Venezuelan uh, uh, president, uh, they are able to reach out throughout uh, the rest of, of the, uh, of the uh, Central and South America. And so uh, over half of the world's 50 terrorist organizations, but specifically Iran, Hezbollah, uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Hamas, are all uh, involved uh, with the drug cartels and, uh, and actually conducting the same businesses uh, that the cartels are, are doing. So you, you see a very strong presence of Hezbollah and Iran in Brazil, uh, Bolivia, uh, Colombia is, is a growing uh, place that you see it uh, growing. And then, uh, you know, all the way from Panama, Guatemala, Ecuador, uh, uh, which is a new one that's come on the screen, and on into Central America. You've got Costa Rica now, which has been pretty much immune for this, this sort of thing, Honduras, and, uh, uh, and right up on into Mexico, so it, it's all through, and you, you see them now uh, connecting with the cartels, you see them uh, exerting themselves in these environments, taking control of communities uh, throughout the region, and uh, what I started to say earlier was in this meeting at DHS, we, we uh, pick up about Five to six hundred of these uh, special interest aliens uh, per year. I was in a meeting where one of the fellows there figured that we're only capturing about six to ten percent uh, of what's uh, coming across the border and what we're capturing. So if you assume ten percent over the last uh, ten years, uh, that, that means there could be a large number of uh, sleeper cells and operatives uh, within the United States operating uh, in the networks. So uh, th they're not just in Venezuela, they're throughout the region. They've got active military forces. Hezbollah is definitely there. They've got, they're running training camps out of Venezuela. Uh, those kinds of things are, are, are going on. Uh, throughout the region. Now, so again, you see them in Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, all of Central America, um, and uh, and the other thing is Latin America is the home to more than six million Muslims, so it's a target-rich environment for Hezbollah recruiting. It also provides a venue for their financial support, recruitment, and opportunities for safe haven, and uh, and they they can operate in you know vast ungoverned areas of Latin in Latin America, and uh, uh, throughout the region. And so, uh, 
So we find that there are more and more activity going on down there all the all the time. Uh, uh, they've had recently uh, very tight connections with the Colombian FARC ETA, uh, and they actually, in fact, train together. Uh, Southern Command reports. Uh, I read a report recently that there's. Uh, Several uh, Margarita Island is a big logistics and support uh, cells that remain there in a very large Lebanese community. So uh, we see activity uh, really all over the place. So, uh, and this isn't by accident. It's a very uh, deliberate strategy, and uh, and so. Uh, there's also uh, evidence, and again, I, this is at an unclassified level, but there's a strong evidence that uh, Hezbollah is teaching bomb making and skills and guerrilla tactics to Mexican drug cartel members, another indication of how they're connecting. Uh, they're also doing this uh, within Honduras, Guatemala. Uh, and right on down into uh, Bolivia. And so this is uh, becoming more and more uh, prevailing uh, methodology they're using throughout the hemisphere. And the ultimate target is the United States. Uh, we've probably been at war with uh, Iran uh, for at least 25 years, and it's escalating. And they also use a lot of uh, fear tactics to try to keep everybody uh, under some control. Uh, the other thing that we've seen recently, and I'm talking the last two years, is a lot of marriage uh, intermarrying uh, with people in the U.S. and Canadian, which gives uh, an appearance of legality to the Hezbollah operatives that are operating in the hemisphere and it allows them to move about and to function more freely including crossing borders at will so uh, so those are those are some of the things that uh, we see going on uh, within the region uh, uh, huge impact my personal opinion is that uh, we in the United States are in denial. Uh, one of the points that Barry McCaffrey points out routinely, uh, you know, we, we had a, uh, the Merida Initiative, which was supposed to be a little over $1 billion, which uh, we never uh, executed uh, to its full intent for all sorts of reasons. But uh, we have a burn rate in, uh, of $10 billion a month in Afghanistan. We have hundreds of aircraft, 85,000 troops, 18,000 been killed and wounded, uh, supporting uh, U.S. national policy objectives 7,000 miles from home. However, our naming attention and resources to the region, the Latin, Mexico and Central and South America, uh, has been anemic next to this thing and if we just took uh, one month's burn rate and applied it uh, wisely we could probably um, have a much better impact uh, in the region than what we've had and then get policies that uh, make sense and uh, but we seem to be uh, in denial over what's going on and we haven't really initiated the kind of debate that uh, I believe that we should have on the subject not only of how to deal with these uh, transnational criminal organizations within our society but how to deal with the, the presence of terrorist organizations and not only those terrorist organizations that are linking, linked to gangs within the United States, but the, the Hezbollah and other agencies that are being supported by Iran and Venezuela and what we ought to do about it. My personal opinion is we're not doing much right now. Um, however, um, that's kind of where we're at. And so... Those are a few of my thoughts today, and I'll take any questions you might have.
All right, folks, this is Staff Sergeant Bryant with the CKC. If you have any questions, please type them in the uh, chat Q&A on the left-hand side, and we will get them answered for you. Okay, the first uh, question is, are there lists or maps of where dual societies are in America? I don't know that, uh, uh, that there's been any maps created. I have not seen any myself uh, personally. But I do know where communities exist in this country. Uh, and I get reports uh, continuously through my network of law enforcement um, concerned about it, and they're they kind of got the um, uh, the uh, chamber of commerce syndrome going on that they don't want to really talk about it publicly as a fear that it'll hurt business and other things within the community. But it certainly is a serious concern of uh, of law enforcement and. Uh, what I will do is I'll send a report we're just finishing up. We've had some round tables of border sheriffs, and uh, they talk about this particular subject and at some length and their concerns about it and not being able to do much about it. Okay. Um, uh, also from... Uh, Let's see. I know you can't speak specifics, but are we tracking the training uh, training camps? Uh, I believe we do. I think we know where they're at. Uh, we know specifically where they're at in Venezuela, and uh, they are being tracked uh, by some of our three-letter agencies. Uh, and uh, they tend to be growing, and they seem to be multiplying throughout the region. OK. Uh, David Abreu, is that right? How prevalent is influence of Hamas, Hezbollah in Latin America? Uh, it is not taken seriously because it's on such a small scale. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess, uh, th you know, that's debatable on uh, uh, the scale of it. Again, th the notion here is, is these people are, uh, just like they've done in Iraq and in, in Afghanistan, a lot of these people wanted to... Uh, uh, hide in plain sight. So they don't bring a lot of attention to themselves. They network, they move around, and I think the uh, the influence uh, of them is, is a heck of a lot more than we give it credit for. And I think that we should start uh, a little more focus on it in our intel agencies. Now, some of our agencies are just now starting to pay attention. Now that tells me that that uh, since they're putting more resources and more assets to this that uh, they probably see it as a coming problem. But again, you shouldn't let it fester to the, such a point that uh, it becomes a bigger problem. But I would say it's uh, it's fairly significant. Uh, it's not open, but I've got uh, people that uh, worked for me for years that live throughout the region and they're telling me that it's getting worse and worse by the day and they see all the trappings uh, that uh, come with those kinds of activities. Okay. Um. Okay, let me 
try to keep up with all these uh, Yeah, I will. I will make sure that the uh, report that we just uh, are in the process of publishing uh, for all those that have asked for the report, I will get it to uh, Sergeant Hunt, and uh, hopefully he'll have your email addresses where he can get it out. I will also, if you go to our website, since one of our agendas in our nonprofit is national security. And since we've done a lot on border stuff, you'll see a lot of reports from different agencies posted on our website. And I will post, when we post that report, it will also be posted on our website. And that should occur within, I, I'm going to guess, within the next couple weeks. Okay, do you sense a change in sentiment against Chavez and Chiant's influence in Central and South America? If you mean from a national perspective, no. I don't, uh, uh, I don't see uh, any real change in that. I don't, uh, I don't think we're paying enough attention to it. I don't think we paid enough on the... Uh, uh, China influence in, uh, in Panama and with the canal and all the things that are going on and the, the, the types of things that they're doing throughout the region. And uh, I, I just kind of feel like we're, uh, again, in denial and a little bit as, asleep with the switch. Uh, so I don't see a lot of attention being paid uh, to, uh, but again, I see the U.S. tends to be uh, uh, have a political denial on the scope and severity of the problem as I, myself and others see it. Okay, Eric, uh, that is either government or military. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Uh, Is that a, f Eric, if you could type in, uh, clarify that a little more for me. And the other point I would make is uh, you're probably all aware of, uh, this isn't anything that I don't think anybody that's on here is not aware of, is that more and more we're training our police officers in uh, military tactics. We've had Delta Force in here in Texas that's helped train our police officers. Uh, they're very much equipped and move uh, like a military small unit and because it has gotten more dangerous uh, 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 across the, the uh, the entire border region and uh, it's really more it's actually beyond I would say beyond paramilitary and it's more uh, military operations and in fact I've actually had a lot of the law enforcement people along the border say that we're the last ones that would would want to say this uh, because nobody really wants a military presence uh, down here however we're almost to the point that we need to be reinforced and backed up by the National Guard or even federal forces. So uh, certainly the people that are in the environment, and not only in the environment along the border, uh, I've gotten calls routinely uh, from sheriffs and uh, law enforcement people all over the country that describe how things have changed in their communities and the kinds of things they're dealing with that they've never had to deal with before. Uh, so. Okay, uh, Jessica, has Al Qaeda activity been seen in Latin America, or has the activity been limited uh, to the Shia groups? Uh, I personally have not seen uh, Al Qaeda, other than they their fingerprints are on a number of illegal activities in terms of drugs and uh, movement of uh, some weapons and uh, and. Uh, there's been a couple incidents reported where they've been involved in uh, human trafficking.
Uh, next one, Eric. Uh, I've been in touch with folks working in Peru with the military. They get the impression that there is a de definite split between the military and the government. Military seems to be against Chavez and China influence. Well, I think I think that's true. I think that, uh, and there's probably segments in the military uh, that go different ways. So they're not all cohesive. Uh, there's not a cohesiveness between the military and law enforcement. And you know that the structure in Latin America is a little different than how we think about it. But uh, uh, I think that there is a split. And I think this is part of what these guys want to see uh, within the region anyhow is these kinds of splits. It's to their advantage to have chaos um, because it gives them more freedom of movement and freedom of access and uh, uh, they gain greater influence. So there's no question that uh, there's two different, it's kind of the, the similar thing in my mind, uh, Eric, that uh, we see between the city council and the mayor and the law enforcement folks. The law enforcement folks are saying, wait a minute, we're, we're, we've got some stuff going on here. And the other side said, so there's, there is friction uh, on, on the uh, seams there. And I, I would say that it's the same thing. And I've got a number of people that... Uh, have worked with me through the years, both uh, former DEA intel agents and other people who worked in the military that are living in Honduras and uh, Guatemala, and they're reporting these kinds of things to me uh, literally weekly. So they see the landscape and the tone and the texture of uh, things going on to be uh, changing at a dramatic rate, and, and you know, and it's not always. Uh, you know, it's, we've always had issues throughout the region, uh, just like we've always had region uh, issues along the border. But they're changing, and they look different, they feel different, they taste different. So, uh, the next question, do you think a new regime in Venezuela would help end the terrorist influence in Latin America? Or would it have a little effect? Um, you know, any positive strokes that are anti-terrorist, um, anti-drug uh, society, those kinds of things certainly would have some influence. But I think they've uh, woven a good enough network now throughout the region that uh, without some really concerted uh, effort, um, I, I don't. I don't know that you're going to have much influence on changing their direction. I mean, unless you really start going after them in a big way. Um, so, and I don't. Right now, I don't see that that happening because of the level of corruption, uh, both in the police forces and the military throughout the region, and uh, within the governments. So be candid about it. So. Um, I don't see that there'll be much change. Uh, again, you know, I, I would I would have to say that uh, if going back to Mexico for a minute, uh, uh, you know, Calderon and and his predecessors that have, have really shown some courage to step up, but you know he can't lose the country, so. Uh, you know, uh, they've done some courageous things, and I think that right now uh, we're really at a, uh, a crossroads because of Mexico, uh, because of the new election. We'll see. I mean, right now the new president in Mexico is saying all the right things. Uh, we'll see. I mean, he certainly didn't have a mandate in my mind uh, since 62% of the electorate didn't vote for him. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety throughout the country, which puts the same anxiety throughout the region, and particularly among university students uh, that are worried that everything will return to you know the previous 70 so years of corruption that the PRIs and in, in, in been involved with. But but how that goes really 
drives the rest of it because it's all connected now. I mean, it's not, they're not separate entities. Uh, uh, it's all in, in one big bag. And uh, I, I think there's one other point I'd like to make. Uh, I serve on the, uh, an advisory board to the Tower Center, uh, um, to the T Tower Center at SMU. And each year we have an annual conference. And last year, our conference was on um, nuclear proliferation. Now, I kind of thought that was a not not the right topic. I mean, that was my opinion, but <laughs> I was I certainly. But that's what we went on. And we had all you know uh, Perlman and all the experts in nuclear proliferation. And now what I found surprising was is that all of them immediately went to discussing the transnational criminal organizations and this terrorist nexus that's occurring and the threat, it, the threat that it pr promotes uh, into the U.S. Uh, from a nuclear perspective. And uh, I was a little bit surprised by that, but here's the story. They said that the, the terrorist... Uh, uh, have the ability now to do a dirty bomb. They don't have the ability to, they have the scientific ability, but they don't have the ability to do a nuclear weapon uh, because they don't have the material. But they need enough fissile material uh, to about the size of a baseball or about fill a coffee cup. So they believe that uh, that it, whether it's leaked out, it's stolen, it's given to them by Iran, uh, that the threat of that weapon coming on the world scene is probably no more than eight years out. So the notion is, uh, so I asked the question, I said, well, why do these people seem to be uh, so... Uh, um, interested in connecting with the uh, you know, transnational criminal organizations, cartels, etc. They said it's real simple. It's the network. They have so much better developed network than they have. They'd give their right to eye f to be into that network. So the notion is, is that uh, if you can get the massive amounts of drugs, people at all across the border, now, you certainly could get seven baseballs across the border and seven of these weapons uh, in major cities in the United States uh, would be disastrous. Uh, one of these weapons uh, set off in each of a major city would kill 35,000 to 50,000 people immediately. More would die in the uh, next 90 days. And, of course, it would be... All right, folks, this is uh, Staff Sergeant Brian from the CKC. Looks like we have lost Mr. Pryor's audio. Um, that wraps up about all the questions. I just wanted to remind everyone that there will be a recording of this available on our CKC website. I'll uh, post it up on the blog when I have that up. Um, and Mr. Pryor was talking about a report he was putting together. When I have that, I will get it sent into uh, our blog site also. Uh, lastly, uh, Thursday, this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Time, we'll have Margaret Meyer speaking about uh, the influence of China in the South America and Latin region. Uh, if you have any questions, please email them to info at culturalknowledge.org, and we will be glad to answer them for you. Thank you for participating in our speaker series today.